We're really excited to um, welcome you all to the first Impact at Anderson and Net Impact High Impact Tea series for this year um, on sustainable travel and sustainable tourism. So we have Tara Russell, president and founder of Fathom and global impact lead of Carnival Corporation. Tara is the president, I just mentioned the titles, world, of the world's largest travel and leisure company. Carnival Corporation believes that travel has the unique ability to expand hearts, bring diverse groups of people closer together, and by doing so, help solve many of the global human challenges we face today. Fathom pioneered social impact travel and led the corporation and industry to Cuba in May of 2016. Prior to Fathom, Tara was founder and CEO of Create Common Good, a food production social enterprise that provides training and employment to marginalized populations. Tara is an engineer that started her career in consumer products, including roles in product development with Nike, technical sales and marketing at Intel, and manufacturing with General Motors in the US and overseas. Fast Company Magazine named Russell one of its most creative people in business. So just for context in terms of Car Carnival Corporation as well, Carnival Corporation employs more than 120,000 people and visits more than 800 destinations. Carnival is intent on harnessing and leveraging their scale for meaningful impact. Tara's executive role involves developing vision, frameworks, and strategies to ensure Carnival leads the travel industry in impact innovation and helps further the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals. We also have jo with us, uh, joining us from Kind Traveler, Jessica Blotter, who's the CEO and co-founder of Kind Traveler. Jessica, uh, the moment Jessica discovered that the love of travel can't be separated from the state of the world after witnessing poverty on a trip to Belize in 2012, she wondered how the $7 trillion travel industry could be harnessed to benefit local communities, the environment, and animals. This experience led her and her co-founder to launch KindTraveler.com, a public benefit corporation that's the first socially conscious give and get hotel booking platform empowering travelers to become a force for good. On KindTraveler.com, exclusive rates are offered from curated kind hotels, which we'll hear more about today, upon a $10 nightly donation to a local charity that positively impacts the visiting destination or to a favorite charity of choice. 100% of the donations raised on the Kind Traveler platform go directly to charities. Travelers can search for kind hotels based on initiatives towards wellness, sustainability, and community impact. And Kind Traveler's impact goals are also aligned with the United Nations Global Goals for Sustainable Development. Since launching Kind Traveler, Jessica has been featured in more than 200 news and blog outlets, including the New York Times, Condé Nast, Travel and Leisure, um, and has also delivered a TEDx salon talk on the future of travel, Purpose is King. So please join me in welcoming both Tara and Jessica to the stage, please. So before we get started, I, I wanted to maybe turn it over to both of you to talk a little bit more. I mean, I mentioned, of course, the profile of both of your companies, but just maybe share a little bit of an overview of your organizations so that everybody in the audience can get a sense for what perspective of the travel and sustainable travel ecosystem you represent. It's really fun to be here. You guys have a beautiful campus. What a great time of the year to come, too. Uh, so thanks for having us. Uh, I sort of accidentally fell into the travel space. Um, I'm sort of a serial social entrepreneur and had been building companies on the outside. Uh, but Carnival Corporation is the world's largest travel and leisure company. We're sort of a family and portfolio of companies. So we own Seaborn, Holland America, Princess, Carnival, Fathom, the company that we built, uh, a company called Cunard, PO UK, Aida, Costa, and a brand called PO Australia. We also own things like trains and hotels and have private destinations. We own a television network. We have a gaming platform. So we're in the business of delivering human experiences. And really, um, what intrigued and interested me about the opportunity was the size and scale of the platform that we have in terms of how broadly we touch the world. So we travel to about 800 locations. Uh, we have 120,000 employees from more than 150 countries. Um, and we literally kind of work with everybody, it feels like, in the world. And so we have a really meaningful platform for influence. Thank you. Uh, so Kind Traveler launched in August of 2016. So we've been live just over two years. Uh, we currently have 80 hotels on the platform in eight different countries. And uh, the premise of the platform, as Bhavna mentioned, um, travelers receive exclusive rates and perks when they give back a $10 nightly donation to benefit a charity that's in the visiting destination or to a charity of choice. Um, we're really excited about some new destinations we've launched. Um, recently, as an example, um, we have 
new hotels in Sonoma, California, for example, and I just wanted to share kind of what it looks like so you can wrap your head around it, but um, one hotel is called H2 Hotel, and a $10 donation to Russian River Keepers will uh, help clean up 250 pounds of trash out of the Russian River, which is essential to that community, uh, and unlock an exclusive rate, which is about a savings of 10 to 15% off of advertised rates elsewhere. Um, but then as a thank you for the donation, the hotel also gives like a $25 dining credit, $25 spa credit, um, and things like that to motivate um, the, the donation and the giving back experience. So the model itself is a, we say a triple win because hotels become more socially responsible. Uh, charities, of course, are getting 100% of donations and travelers have a values aligned vacation, um, which is in turn, in turn creates a more meaningful and um, aligned travel experience. And so that's really the essence of the platform. And uh, that model also allows us to measure our impact because we, we know exactly what t a $10 nightly donation will, will do, what kind of impact that will create for each charity. And we have about 60 nonprofit partners that we represent on the platform as well. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so I, how many of you have heard of sustainable tourism? or any other term, can you shout out what kind of resonates when you think about that? I've heard of law and tourism. Law and tourism, okay. I've heard that's not the best thing. <laughs> right. So I guess my, my next question is really about what is sustainable tourism? It seems to have really, I think it's not necessarily a new concept. It's been around with different terminology like ecotourism or things like that, but it seems to have taken the main stage quite a, quite a bit in the last couple of years. So if you both could share maybe, um, you know, what is sustainable tourism? What does it look like today? Is it the same as ecotourism, responsible tourism, all these terms that we're hearing? And what elements of it, if any, are new? Yeah, um, well, you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of different language in this space. I think uh, travel is the largest industry on the planet behind government spending. So when I think about sustainable tourism, you know, I think it, about the opportunity for travel to be an industry that positively sort of benefits and contributes to both communities and the environment in a way that the world and these communities can actually sustain moving forward. So, you know, I think uh, the idea would be that any traveler who uh, wants to visit a destination or a place is actually, you know, having a win-win experience with that place and that that community um, is left better than it might have been before that person arrived. That would be the intent or the aspiration. And so I think, you know, for our business, um, you know, it's it's super imperative that the communities can win and be positively affected for our business to be able to continue to those communities, but also to support the health and welfare of that region. And so, you know, you you hear terms like you mentioned, uh, volunteerism. And I think there is the individual traveler behavior for sure that has the potential to influence or impact. But I think it's also about the broader practice of the business or the industry in terms of that area. And so right now you're hearing a lot about over tourism. And, you know, tourism is one of the fastest growing industries on the planet. And I think 10% of the jobs in the world come from the travel and tourism space. And so, you know, there are all kinds of impacts with that growth. I think it's 1.4 billion people travel um, today. And so some communities have been able to manage that growth and others haven't. And so we can kind of get into more of that, but that's, you know, there's lots of dynamics involved. Yeah, and I would agree. Um, there's sort of general broad sweeping definitions of sustainable tourism, very similar to responsible tourism. They all sort of fit in the same wheelhouse, but like Tara said, it's generally any type of travel that positively impacts local communities, the environment, as well as economies. And the reason it's so important, as Tara mentioned, is because it is um, you know, one of the world's largest economic powerhouses. And if it's harnessed to be a force for good, it can address society's biggest challenges, such as climate change, poverty, uh, reducing inequality. So the industry is so big that 2017 was actually designated the year of sustainable tourism by the United Nations. 
um, sort of recognizing this industry to um, to really sort of, um, they put out a call to action for businesses, industry leaders, individuals to recognize the economic power of this industry and to create innovations in ways that make it sustainable. Uh, so I think that um, you had mentioned the, you know, where it has shifted and you know, at one point years ago, people would maybe think of sustainable tourism in a go to Costa Rica and you know sleep in an eco lodge on a cot and on the floor. But that 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 sort of vision has changed where big cities now um, are taking on sustainability plans. LA um, Mayor Eric Garcetti released his sustainability plan a couple years ago, a call to action. And so um, the movement is really shaping in big cities and small cities to all become sustainable and 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 really harness the force of um, travel businesses, but also the travelers as a whole, the 1.4 uh, billion trips that, that happened just last year. And it continues to escalate. It's one of those industries that doesn't um, really um, get affected by, by industry changes or e economic depression so much. It continually grows. So it's about how to mitigate that growth in a way that's sustainable. It's really interesting. I, I I recently read an article about an island in the Philippines. I can't remember the name of the island, and, and maybe you can help me out. 4K. But maybe so. It's it's essentially they shut down mm -hmm. for six months. Yeah. To essentially, so I guess the assumption is that people. It's, it seems like people assume that if a country is so heavily dependent on tourism for their primary economic opportunity, that they probably have a plan in place to protect those resources that are bringing in tourism. But it doesn't always isn't always the case, and. So they shut down uh, the this island for six months and then reopened with, you know, partnerships between airlines and transportation and all of that so that everybody was kind of aligned in terms of not that many flights to the destination to begin with. And then it's almost every step of the traveler journey was with a sustainable and protective mindset. So I don't know if you could... Well, I think that's a really great example of how if if travel is not not harnessed sustainably, it can actually be a force for negative versus a force for good. And so, and Borke was a, was a perfect example of that, um, where you know they had suffered from like severe pollution of the waters, and um, there was illegal developments all along the beaches, and certain there's just lots of pollution, um, water problems. So. Um, I think that was really a great example, and I know we're going to talk about over tourism in another question. Um, but there, you know, there really is um, a movement um, where you know how can we make these destinations sustainable, but also how can we redistribute um, the you know sort of the other destinations that are um, there's even a a word called under tourism, um, where you know emerging destinations that. Uh, you know, or just, you know, they, they, they depend on tourism dollars to be economically prosper prosperous, but um, travelers just don't know about them. And so there's also this movement in how to create better distribution um, across all the destinations so that they can thrive sustainably through the industry. Um, and I'm really excited about talking about over-tourism because I, I think it's really interesting. I want to, before we talk about that a little bit more, so I, th I think the stats are staggering. So what you're saying 1.9 billion international trips. 1.4 last year. Yeah. And rising, of course. And rising, yep. $7.9 trillion economy, which is 10% of global employment, and like 313 million jobs or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's staggering, jobs. the economic yeah. opportunity. Um, but is there sufficient demand on the consumer side to you know, be viable for the supply side? Sure. Do you? Yeah, right. Well, I was going to say, I think, yeah. you know, there's several macro trends sort of happening in the in the world. I think right now people have disposable income. Economies have been mm -hmm. strong. Um, we also have the rise of, like, the information sort of economy that allows people to learn about places all over the world. And we have channels like YouTube and social media that, you know, provide travelers an imagination of a place long before they might ever go. Um, we have flight you know, accessibility, we have low cost providers. I mean, um, you know, if you think back 10 or 20 years ago, I don't think any of us was sitting at a dinner party on Friday night and someone said, oh wow, I, f I found a really aff affordable flight to Korea this weekend, I'm just gonna hop on a plane and go. But you know, you, I don't know about you, but I hear this kind of thing happening, you know, so much more. And so 
what, what that does is it means there's so much more access and there's so much more awareness, um, but it also is creating some of these challenges, new challenges for us to deal with. And so when we think about the space of over-tourism, and if you're interested in that space, there's a couple studies, um, there's so much content out there, but there are a couple recent studies that I think are really well done. One that McKinsey um, did in partnership with the World Travel and Tourism Council. It's fantastic, um, and it kind of outlines the primary frameworks around the idea of over-tourism. So this idea of the preservation of culture, this idea of you know the sufficient infrastructure in a community to handle people coming, this idea of like degradation of local environments, you know, community mindset, how people feel. So to give you a sense, like place like Venice, right? I think today the local population of Venice, and I don't know if any of you've been there, but Venice itself is actually a pretty small area. There are about 55,000 residents that live in Venice. Venice, Italy. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there are about 24, 25 million travelers who come to Venice. So like there's this uh, proportional look from a data perspective that communities are starting to take, which is this idea of how many travelers comparative to how many locals. And that gives you some sense of the potential challenges that that area or region may be facing. And kind of like Jessica mentioned, you know, one of the kind of cool things about our businesses is we are looking at this and trying to kind of strategize about how to be an even better solution partner to some of these areas. We can literally change our pathways. We can create economic development possibilities in a place, an island, or a region that maybe nobody's heard of and really kind of help to balance and manage some of the, the people flow to a place, which is cool. But to give you a sense, like in Venice, I think we're about 1% of the traveler base that arrives in Venice. Um, and so, you know, you have the rise of uh, the outbound Chinese travelers, to give you a sense. It's just beginning outbound travel outside of China, and yet it's beginning at like 170 million people. <laughs> this wow. next year is the estimate or something. You know, so to give you a sense, like the, China is going to be the largest sending traveler economy very, very soon, right? And so there is just a growth in travel from every part of the world, which is, you know, exciting, but just, you know, is, um, is complicated for all of these places. And so, as Jessica mentioned as well, you know, there's, there's great new resource groups, some that have been around a long time, some that are popping up, that are trying to be thought partners to these communities and to the, the areas in terms of different tools, resources, technologies, strategies that they might consider uh, leveraging to kind of manage that traveler base and flow in a positive way. And obviously, part of what we think for our business is like, as we're learning what one community is doing or apps or technologies or things, we can then help to kind of translate some of that value to maybe some of the underdeveloped or lesser resourced areas. So that's Actually, this season I'm kind of entering in terms of my work um, is we're spending more and more time in that space because obviously this is becoming a, you know, a bigger problem. Yeah, um, to your question about the demand, um, I think that um, to understand the demand of, of travel is to look back and kind of see, you know, 50% of the world now is has a cell phone and access to social media. And so with that access is transparency across you know, all industries. No, no longer can you know, things sort of be hidden. And so um, you know, as you probably may know from your other, other classes and, and such, but you know, when you look at some of the stats globally, like half the world goes to bed hungry, or the fact that more species are going endangered now than any other time in history, or um, as lack of water or lack of clean air becomes more constricted, um, all of that information is more publicly available and, and, and the population as a whole has access to that information more so now than ever before. And so with access to that information, consumers are more educated more so than any other time in history. And so with that education, they, they are looking to businesses to help um, create you know, ways to make their purchasing more sustainable. And um, as that relates to the travel industry, the recent, you know, recent studies share that 
Um, a bit over 70% of travelers want to give back when they travel. They want to make sustainable travel choices. However, um, a lack of options that really make it easy fail to exist. And that's really where the innovation opportunity is in the industry. And it's making it easy um, for travelers to make those um, sustainable travel choices. Uh, because just as you see in you know the sort of slow fashion industry that has really taken off, and other industries have really done a great job um, in, in in becoming more sustainable, travel also has that that opportunity uh, to do so. And um, but the change must start within the industry as well as with consumers um, really being you know uh, voting with their dollars and putting their actions where their their hearts are and voting for causes that. They care about by purchase by you know purchasing from companies that are doing the good work and making uh, sustainable travel choices easy. So it's like a two-sided thing um, to to really make the change in, within the industry happen um, as on the demand side. It's really interesting you bring up the the apparel industry, right? Because I think there's been a ton of work being done in terms of labor standard awareness, child labor, and all of that that's gotten us to a point where now we understand that cheaper is not better and cheaper means something has gotten sacrificed along the way. So really kind of questioning our, our decisions that we make each time we notice a sale. 70% off means something along the way didn't capture the value of that value chain. Where is the travel industry in terms of that? So in terms of, you know, with more and more demand for traveling, it seems like flights and cheaper flights and cheaper, you know, destinations. And, and then there's the other side of it, which is luxury. So where is there the kind of price elasticity for consumers to recognize that, you know, maybe, maybe certain areas spending is better in terms of a more meaningful travel experience in the whole sense of that word? Well, it's interesting, you know, because within our portfolio of brands, we serve every customer. So we have our kind of entry level um, cruise product is through our Carnival brand. And for many of our travelers on Carnival, it's their first vacation ever. So when, you know, Ted Erickson and his family founded Carnival, and Mickey was just sharing about this this last week, you know, their vision was really to give any family the choice to take holiday with their family. And, um, and it has really provided that access to so many people. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the world's highest end luxury brand, Seaborn. And, you know, the price point of Seaborn is, is far out of reach um, from most consumers. However, what's interesting to your question is what I notice is while the macro consciousness of consumers is definitely growing, the, the wallet capacity in terms of willingness to pay what is said versus what is done is, is not caught up. So to give you a sense, in our company, Seaborn consumers are demanding sustainable solutions and they have capacity to pay for it. And so, for instance, in our uh, corporation, Seaborn's doing some remarkably amazing, innovative impact work. And I'm super excited about some of what we're going to be sharing in the coming couple of years. And, you know, they go to the Arctic and have a couple expedition ships coming out. But again, that price point is so far out of reach for most consumers that they're able to spend and invest in some of these innovations. Whereas the truth is, a lot of consumers, while they want and they say they want that, they actually aren't willing to spend it. And that's the dance right now, is we're going to kind of, for the next, I think, handful of years, be in this interesting kind of weird kind of tweener tension space, um, because companies are going to have to, through regulation changes and things happening, they're going to have to make changes that cost uh, you know, meaningful investment. And yet, it'll be interesting to see how consumer appetite, um, you know, navigates that. I think what's exciting, though, is younger consumers tend to be willing to spend more in terms of their, like, values dollars and experience dollars. So they don't have as much capacity, but they are spending a greater portion of their wallet on experiences. And so... You know, it's just, it's a really interesting season. Um, and I still feel encouraged and hopeful because, again, with the consciousness of consumers, with the regulations that are coming, and then just in order to do the right thing, I think, you know, you've got a, a growing body of leaders across, you know, startups and big companies who are trying, we're trying to come together and really 
collaborate. I mean, the way Jessica and I met was because of our work. And what's exciting, we sort of think of ourselves as a little bit of a, like an ecosystem you know, convener because we touch so much of the world. So we don't think it's our job to do everything, but we do want to kind of spur and support the ecosystem of partners and always be learning and then sharing in a way that's kind of like an open source innovation, you know, platform um, for good. Yeah, absolutely. So Fathom um, became a corporate sponsor of Kind Traveler um, before we had even launched. And so that was how we met and um, was really a great testimony to their support of, of really um, harnessing an ecosystem of social good travel companies that are, you know, sort of working together. Um, and that was a great testament to that. So um, I think that that's a really innovative way for startups to think about um, partnerships in their early stages is, you know, I mean, because Tara really represents you know, the largest leisure travel company in the world. And, and that's much, very much different than, you know, um, Kind Traveler, a public benefit corp that is still tech, you know, we are a startup. And so um, it's a very, uh, you know, different perspective, but yet we, we came together and are working together. And I think that that's a really, really cool thing. Um, but the, the, going back to the question of, um, you know, making these sustainable choices and how do travel, travelers go about doing, doing that, um, there's a couple, uh, you know, there's lots of things out there, but there's a couple groups. Um, one is called Impact Travel Alliance. They're a nonprofit research. They do a lot of research. They're really committed to advocacy and education. If, if you're interested in learning about this topic more, I would suggest download. They just released a thought leadership study. Um, it's extensive and provides a lot of research on this industry. Another group is the Center for Responsible Travel, also known as CREST, and um, they have lots of different resources on their websites of, of, of sustainable travel organizations that are um, just you know, doing really amazing things in the industry. Um, but um, the, you know, as far as the, the demand and, and who is the most interested, the, the research does say that it's millennials, families, and affluent demographics that are most interested in sustainable tourism at this time. Um, but with that said, that you know, there's a large range of um, you can travel sustainably as a luxury travel traveler or as a millennial that has a limited budget. Um, it really, um, you know, the, where where the decision making has to come in play and how to make these decisions decisions is to have an educated consumer um, that you know knows how to sort of um, you know put their dollars towards um, the companies that are committed to giving back. They're committed to environmental sustainable, sustainability. Um, they have initiatives in place with their local community. Um, so there, there's a very broad price range um, to, to in ways that this can happen. Um, so so it's, it's different than the, the fashion industry where if you're paying $10 for a t-shirt, it might be questionable. Travel industry is so diverse. I could take a an impact tour with visit.org, for example, which is a sustainable tour company that works with nonprofits and everything's been vetted very thoroughly. And it might only cost me $25 to go and you know, visit a uh, wildlife uh, conservation project down in Belize and participate in some way. So the cost, um, the price point, it's, it's extremely wide. Um, so, but you do see from luxury hotels to hostels, you see them all taking on these initiatives. It comes down to uh, you as a consumer doing a little bit of research to, to see you know, who has um, the initiatives in place that are important in making a conscious uh, decision. Does that make sense? Yeah, and actually I'm going to build on that and ask you, um, you know, similar to I think in order to make it easier for consumers to know how to make some of those right choices, we have in the supply chain um, and fair value uh, industry, we have you know, fair trades certifications or um, follow the frog for the rainforest alliance um, or you know things like that are there things that you're seeing that are emerging and Jessica you've done a lot of this with kind traveler and kind of uh, assigning uh, indications for certain areas is there anything coming up in the travel industry that could be it's probably not there yet in terms of a sign of approval or something like that that we could follow um, that would help kind of establish industry standards or you know. I really wish there was um, there you know it, it's so diverse I mean you have lead certification 
uh, which is, you know, only relates to new uh, buildings. You have um, green leaf. I mean, there's so many different types of, of certifications for buildings. Um, I think that uh, most, when it comes to lodging at least, and hospitality um, initiatives um, that are in play are, uh, there's, you know, certainly a movement where they're becoming more transparent and listing them on their website. I mean, Kind Traveler is trying to, you know, take the initiatives that the hotels have in play as it relates to promoting environmental sustainability, um, as well as wellness initiatives and community impact and, and display them. And on, you know, that's what we do on as part of um, what Kind Traveler does is we showcase hotels by these initiatives that they have in place. Um, but it really, there's such a wide range um, of initiatives and I wish there was like a standardized gold seal of a sustainable hotel, but um, we're trying to make it easy for travelers to make those decisions so that, you know, um, travelers can make informed decisions. And the one thread that all of the 80 hotels on Kind Traveler ha do have in common is that they're all committed to giving back. And you know that because um, they've all offered, you know, really cool, uh, ex you know, perks, some exclusive rates, and they're all showing, showcasing their commitment to it's giving, um, you know, incentive to donations and are, are working um, with those local charities in some way in capacity already. Um, they, you know, we're making it really easy for hotels to take on these initiatives. A lot of them already work with these charities in some way, but they don't have a traveler facing initiative um, in play. Most hotel websites are really busy about, you know, selling room packages and they want to just drive a booking. And so you have to kind of dig in the layers of the website to find out what they're doing for sustainability, where we're taking those uh, initiatives and putting them front and center for people to make informed decisions. So, um, so yeah, the, the standardization is, uh, it really just there's so many Not facets, better. and sustainable, sustainability isn't just about the environment. It's about community impact um, and how, you know, that uh, business might be dri driving a positive economic impact as well. So it's quite diverse and different. Yeah. But looking for hotels that have or lodging, when it comes to buying your plane ticket, buying carbon, you know, offset credits, like every facet of travel, I think that there's things that every facet can do, whether it's um, public transportation, you know, when uh, when you get there, figure, you know, maybe not even considering flying. Maybe your travel becomes more about regional destinations and places that don't require you to fly across the world. Um, so, it, you know, every leg of the travel experience, there's something that can be done on the sustainability side. It's just, and I know that that's a question that's coming up. We'll save that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I recently learned a few months ago there is some um, there there are some practices being established in the space of animal welfare. So mm. the I think it was the Buenos Aires um, Declaration either last year or earlier this year um, has put out a set of standards and tried to get a variety of the large companies to sort of you know abide by these standards in terms of animal welfare and protection. So I, I agree with you. I think the world of travel is so broad and hairy and so international mm -hmm. that there isn't yet a super easy way. Um, I know it's it's part of even our internal discussion is like, are there, it's kind of like when I was at Nike, we developed something called the shape audit for our factories and we don't own the, fa or didn't own the factories, but we essentially set a standard and criteria to sort of qualify and strengthen the factories that would do business with us. And then we really brought them up to that standard. So in many ways, um, we're even sort of having a, a bit of that discussion around some of our on-ground tour providers and partners, like is there a way that we might become kind of an education and empowering vessel to sort of qualify some of those, but um, a lot of opportunity in the space for sure. Right. I'm going uh, to turn to the audience just to see if you guys have any questions right now. I have lots of questions on paper and in my mind, so I can keep talking and asking, but... You guys have any questions in the audience so far, Tara or Jessica? Yeah.
so you just mentioned for every facet of travel, there's something that we can do. Can you give a few more specific examples that just as like a, you know, one individual who is about to go on a trip, like the things that I might want to think about before yeah, I actually absolutely. go on the trip? Yeah, and the reason I didn't elaborate because I know that she has a question that specifically is about that. But a few things, um, you know, look at ways to go completely plastic free. I think that um, we now have reusable uh, bags, straws and water bottles. So eliminating plastic waste in developing countries is um, extremely important. Um, so um, just saying no to plastic. Um, another thing is, you know, when you travel, uh, when you're buying souvenirs, like support local artisans, support local restaurants. Um, those are some things um, on the animal welfare front. Um, Avoiding, you know, animal attractions as a whole um, usually is um, good responsible practice. Um, there's a, even a blog post on our website right now, uh, 14 animal attractions to avoid. Um, elephant, you know, riding elephants in Thailand, so to speak. Like, um, there's sustainable, if you want to visit elephants, there's sustainable ways to do it by um, visiting, you know, vetted nonprofits that are actually rehabilitating animals um, because there's a lot of practices going on in the industry where um, on the wildlife front, um, animals are being drugged um, for selfies. You know, you've seen pictures of people like snuggling up with like baby lion cubs. It's because they're heavily drugged. Um, so, so staying away from animal attractions is, you know, personally something I'm really passionate about and that piece of education um, but, um, you know, when it comes to lodging, looking for hotels, again, committed to, to green practices, giving back to their community, um, choosing activities that um, there's a lot of nonprofits that have really amazing experiences and activities, and you're also supporting these nonprofits. One here in Los Angeles that I do a lot of work with that I love is called the Marine Mammal Care Center, and they're down in um, San Pedro, and uh, it's open 364 days a year, and you can go there for free. You can make a donation if you'd like, but you can take an educational tour and learn about how they're rehabilitating sea lions and seals that have been stranded um, on the coast for various reasons, malnourishment, injury, et cetera. Um, so, um, you know, there's things like that, um, activities that are sustainable, and I think it's up to us as travelers to, to find those activities, um, source them out, and, and do that research uh, ahead of time uh, to, to really make our trip feel, feel sustainable. Hi there. Um, my name is Cassandra. I'm in the executive MBA program here. And I'll be doing my business creation opportunity next term, focusing on business. Um, sorry, business travel. And so I wanted to ask you a twofold question. Out of the 1.4 billion that traveled last year, how many of those were business travelers? And then secondly, what um, footprint or, or impact are these business travelers ha having in sustainability? I mean, I just know off the top that 30% of all travel is business travel. And so 70% is leisure. That's across the board. As far as the impact of the business traveler in terms of financial impact or? Yeah, the research that, that I've read that, um, you know, sustainable initiatives certainly do apply to the business traveler too, but it's largely the leisure traveler that is most interested in, in how to travel sustainably when they vacation. Um, but I know, you know, there's certainly initiatives in place for business travelers as well. But the, uh, the industry, it, it seems like the initiatives are really catered to leisure travelers for the most part, tours, vacations that are sustainable. But there's certainly room for innovation on the business side. Yeah, I think, you know, especially with large companies, sometimes it's going to take new creative partnerships, right? And ways that, because, you know, for instance, in my... Um, world and I travel quite a bit for my work, um, you know, we have almost like an internal travel department that books everything, right? And so we're limited in terms of some of the choices that we have. But I mean, back to your question about the things you can each do, Jessica gave a lot of great examples of, of choices you can make every day. I mean, things you can do to 
reduce your energy usage and reduce your waste and be a mindful traveler. Um, you know, I think in any hotel or accommodation you stay in, turn off your lights, you know, don't you, you know, put all your linens on the floor every time, you know, the amount of energy that goes into laundering linens in hotels and any accommodation is enormous, right? So just being thoughtful about that. Um, and then even just wherever you're staying, you know, connect with the people working in your hotel. You know, meet the person who is coming in and out of your room and, you know, make that connection with that human and, and just an opportunity to get closer to someone there. And so, you know, I really do think it's just through like mindful, you know, presence wherever you are. And then as Jessica mentioned, just, you know, learning what you can about the place that you might be visiting. And, you know, for based on your own heart and your own interests, really identifying what in that area or region, you know, you want to kind of go a little closer to. I think, you know, why travel is um, so exciting is it's such a rich, like, petri dish for learning and for connecting. And so I think just, you know, and Jessica has said this well, you know, your dollars are your biggest kind of boat in terms of how you spend, you know, your time and energy. And just so you know, um, something for you to look into for your research as well, I don't know if you're familiar for those of you that don't know, the um, UCLA Office of Sustainability um, essentially started an initiative last year that they're piloting in whereby every travel that's booked through the university for staff or faculty um, we're charged an extra fee, which goes into an innovation fund that is going to be used to look at ways to neutralize our carbon footprint from for airfare, for air travel, that is. So that might be something you want to look into as well at UCLA itself, the initiative that's, because there's a lot of travel that happens for, for staff and faculty here as well. So it's really interesting. Um, there were some more questions. And then. Uh, yeah. Um, tying into the theme of individual responsibility and awareness, as institutions, how do you nudge consumers towards engaging with local culture in a more meaningful way than just sort of Instagram selfie-driven status travel, which is becoming increasingly more popular? That's a, I mean, it's a great question. I think, um, again, there's a, there's a lot of different ways you could approach it. One of the things we try to do is we introduced a consumer brand, Fathom. We introduced a travel experience, a seven-day product. We sort of literally took people, showed people a very different way to travel that was this sort of idea of, of deep travel and getting closer to the places that you go to. And Jessica and Sean were able to um, experience that with us. But what we did is we essentially spent um, a, a good bit of time, and we've now done this in several countries, but actively listening to the community across diverse groups of stakeholders, you know, business leaders, NGO leaders, community leaders, faith-based leaders, education leaders, and really hearing what their hopes and dreams for those communities were and what organizations in their community um, sort of were interested in alongside partnerships with travelers. and. We spend a lot of time because it's super nuanced. It's not always a good idea to have travelers engage with certain things in a community. Um, you have to be really careful and protective about things that are genuinely beneficial to that area. And so we spent a, a good deal of time, and yet um, we really built some beautiful alongsided partnerships. Uh, and typically, we focus on the space of education, economic development, and the environment. And so. Most all of our opportunities now across a variety of countries um, have that kind of offering. So one thing we do is we just provide travel experiences that you can participate with. So instead of you having to just figure it out yourself, if you want to come with us and go to you know, a small social enterprise in the northern coast of the Dominican Republic and meet these women who are part of this organic Chocolate cooperative. Which and, I did. I, yeah, I, was I actually thing. had that experience. It was really amazing. It's a little bit like the I Love Lucy episode um, <laughs> where she's like, you know, fumbling chocolate. But um, you essentially get to learn from the process of, of literally harvesting the cacao to the point of it becoming an organic chocolate bar. You get to participate with every aspect from planting seedlings to, you know, being a part of the assembly or the packaging process. And so you get to learn that cool thing that's maybe part of your everyday life if you like chocolate. Um, I'm one of the strange individuals in the world. 
planet that doesn't really care for chocolate, but um, you also get to just connect with these beautiful humans who this is their passion and their dream. These 30 women who'd never been to school said, you know what, we can turn that cacao into chocolate. And they came together. And so there's a lot of ways to be inspired when you get close to the communities you travel to. And I just, you know, that's for us, the brand of Fathom is this whole idea of getting closer. And we think that when you get closer to the staff in the places you're going or to the locals in the communities that you're visiting, we think um, you know, where your story intersects the story of others is when kind of the magic mm. happens. And so you know, we provide those experiences, but we also have um, different onboard education and workshops and ways we tease kind of the curiosity of our travelers so that they want to have their own adventures even if they don't you know, buy one of the travel experiences with us. And that's what brought us together is that I found out about their impact travel initiative and thought it was such a great match, you know, in sort of um, uniting these like-minded missions together. And so, like she said, I had an opportunity to go down to the Dominican Republic and experience her impact um, experiences that were available on the cruise. And um, it, I mean, you know, we one particular thing that we did besides um, visiting the local social enterprise um, for the cacao de uh, establishment, but we um, got to teach English in, in local schools in the DR. And I uh, had never experienced that before. And I realized that I'd been walking around with this gift of teaching English that I didn't even know I had. I'd been walking around with this gift and wasn't necessarily sharing it. And that experience um, brought that to life for me, which really made my trip so much more meaningful and impactful. And then I came back here and wrote a blog post about it, um, about that experience. But that's what really made it memorable and um, brought it full circle for me. And I want to build on your question since you brought up social media um, and we were talking about over tourism earlier. Mm -hmm. In the world, in the age of Pinterest, and everybody's next travel experience is probably brought to you by Pinterest, um, how do you, what are some tips or tricks that we as consumers can do to not add to the over-tourism you know, crisis right now in terms of identifying destinations to travel to that are amenable to tourists and receiving tourists, but also not putting a strain on the system? Do you guys have any tips or any innovation that's happening in that area? Yeah. Um, so... So there was actually just a big conference in D.C. that was put on um, by CREST, which is the Center for Responsible Tourism. And um, the, whole ta the whole conference was about over-tourism. And um, the, um, there's a few things happening in the space as they look for ways to sort of redistribute travelers into different, um, maybe lesser-known destinations. Um, there's a website called Ethical Traveler, and they every year evaluate the top 10 best places to visit based on what these destinations are doing for human rights, um, environmental sustainability, and um, sort of your, you know, by, by going to those destinations, like I think the number one destination was Belize, it was Costa Rica, Chile, Uruguay, were a few of them on the list. And so by going to those places, um, not only are you sort of voting with your dollars and supporting destinations that are doing great things for their community, um, but you're also helping in sort of that redistribution um, so that um, tourism dollars are, from a holistic perspective, supporting uh, local communities where they need it the most. And so you're redistributing you know, wealth in a way um, by, do, by making those types of decisions and supporting destinations that are supportive um, for for tourism and ready to sustain you know tourism um, experiences. So that's I think a, a great tip. You know um, when you think of for example last night I went to a event um, tourism Ireland. Um, they were here in town and uh, every every city in Ireland was there except for Dublin. And I said, well, how, where's Dublin? Oh, well, there's enough visitors to Dublin. Everybody knows about Dublin. Um, we want people to go to places like Belfast and some of these other places that are just as culturally rich and amazing, um, but are a little bit off the map. And people don't you know, know about them as much just because they're just not as popular. So that's really the, 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 the lens that you have to look through in choosing the destinations that you want to travel to. 
Yeah, I think the other thing you can do is, you know, let's say you really want to go to uh, an iconic kind of marquee destination, you know, a place like Venice, Italy, or somewhere that you know is experiencing, um, you know, an enormous amount of travelers, go in the off season, you go in January, you find cheaper rates. And so like some of these cities, the way they're trying to navigate and manage it is they're changing really their pricing strategy. Um, the national parks here in the United States are one of the people that are facing this issue the most. Um, and they've really changed how they're thinking about ticket prices to enter the park. So it might be that if you go between like 8 a.m. and noon, there's one ticket price. And if you go between noon and four, you know, it's another ticket price. So they're managing some of their traveler flow through, you know, pricing structure. Um, you know, there's also new apps and technology that are helping you understand the flow of travelers in a place. And so when you actually get to a city, for cities that do have this kind of technology, paying attention. And so if the data is out there, you know, do your homework so that you try not to go to the places that are, you know, 250% saturated. Um, try to be mindful of that and maybe explore a different area of the community or town. You know, one of the conversations we're having internally too is like in areas, um, so Dubrovnik, Croatia, for instance, is an area that um, is facing a, a massive growth of travelers. So we're trying to strategize with them about kind of a broader area and, a, and sort of ways that we can help people come to know the whole region. And so not just that tiny little um, community in that, you know, part of their country. And so I think you know, again, mindfulness matters a lot. And then just doing a bit of homework, um, you know, in terms of, of social media, I just, I think, you know, being positive in terms of the light of what you share and being mindful that this is somebody's home. And, mm -hmm. um, and so just, you know, making thoughtful choices about the kinds of things you highlight when you are telling stories to your community back home. Another question? Hi, thank you guys so much for being here. I just want to ask for some of the places with less developed tourism industry, how, uh, what are some ways to ensure that revenue from tourism stay localized and internalized? And specifically um, for island nations that's less developed and with less tourists. If you guys know anything about that. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, the biggest opportunity, you know, when you think about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, there's 17 different kind of goals and frameworks. The first one is, you know, alleviation of poverty and, the, you know, the opportunity to create jobs and economic development. And so I think that it's important for, especially big companies like ours, right, to be strategizing with these areas about what kinds of, shared value market opportunities there are if and as uh, local businesses start or grow their business. So we try to have a lot of discussion even before we might come, whether it's around transportation needs or whether it's about tour interests of the traveler base and what is kind of the psychographic mentality of that traveler so a community might know the kinds of things. Um, but you know, I think it's important to have active dialogue and relationship so that there's understanding on both sides. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's important for, you know, it's really interesting. We've done some, um, the woman who's led our Australia business over the last 10 years, a remarkable woman, um, Anne Sherry, she was named like woman of the year in Australia. She's a total powerhouse. But she's um, driven some really beautiful shared value relationships in South Pacific and like Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu and the like, French Polynesia area and you know it's taken I mean like you know she shows up in some of these places in her leadership team and like you know people don't have shoes and I mean it's it's unbelievably primitive so it takes a lot of patience and a lot of time um, it isn't an overnight thing um, it it means being willing to pace you know the rate of growth too so that those islands can grow and develop some of the infrastructure capability and capacity um, at times. So for instance, we've just enabled like a bunch of ambulance, like we've invested in ambulances and healthcare centers and other things that actually you wouldn't think are 
really related to the travel industry, but what they've done is provide more opportunity for people to want to come and feel safe to come. So it's sort of being creative and then spending enough time to get to what's the right, um, right ways to kind of win together. I can speak on the hospitality side. Um, on just on behalf of Kind Traveler, um, one of the things we do is we provide a direct booking to the hotel. So the actual final booking, um, once you go through Kind Traveler, you donate, you get your exclusive rate, but you actually book on the hotel's website. Um, and so that's very different than an Ex Expedia or so some of these larger, you know, online travel agencies also called as OTAs, like Kayak, for example. Um, there's usually a pretty big percentage of, of commission that is taken there, um, that's essentially taken away from, from the hotel. So models like Kind Traveler, where we take a, uh, we still take a commission because that's how we make our money, but it's not quite as big as um, some of the larger OTAs. So therefore, you know, more of those tourism dollars um, actually will stay with those lodging accommodations that may be unique to that destination. Um, so, I mean, that's one, one thing that um, Kind Traveler is doing to keep tourism dollars um, in, the, in the local community, but also by supporting these local nonprofits by giving them 100% of the donation. So these nonprofits are, have been identified in these communities to be working on you know, important initiatives that are essential to sustainability or community impact in whatever which ways. And so um, by way of traveling that way, we, we know that the dollars are going back to really support um, these nonprofits that are, or charities that are essential to the destination. So I can speak from that side of it. One thing we haven't had a chance to explore is your professional journey and how you got to where you are. We definitely have students in the audience that are thinking about what they're going to do after their MBA, so, um, and a lot of them want impact careers. So um, how did you come upon the roles that you have? Did you happenstance upon them? Did you kind of have a plan in place? Um, so Tara, maybe we start with you on how you got to be where you are. Yeah, um, you know, so my journey has been uh, kind of... Uh, broad and diverse. I, uh, I studied mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech and um, sort of when I was young thought I wanted to grow up and heal the world through medicine. Um, and so I had this whole plan of like engineering to medicine. Um, but my first year at school, I actually started working at General Motors and we had a co-op program at Georgia Tech. And so you would go to school for a quarter and then go to work. And uh, I just, I kind of found the entrepreneurial bug in me and the business um, kind of junkie that was, you know, wedged inside. And I really, I didn't expect to fall in love with uh, manufacturing and the auto industry, but I was just so curious and learn, able to learn so many different things um, from both a product standpoint and a build sort of standpoint, but also just from a business standpoint. And I was exposed to really diverse leaders and all kinds of leadership opportunities um, at a very young age. So I ended up in primarily consumer products um, for kind of my first early career um, with General Motors and had the chance to go to Shanghai and be part of that startup within a big company as sort of my first startup. Um, and I sort of fell in love with, you know, the space of global business during that year in Shanghai. And that was about 20 years ago now, so it was a little while ago. Um, but then I went and worked at Intel for a while, more on the technical sales and marketing side and at Nike in product development. And, you know, in hindsight, it gave me a really good sense of like from product design through manufacturing and kind of every aspect on the both, you know, design development, but then commercial side, sales and marketing wise, um, you know, a really interesting way to kind of experience um, business and yet I always wanted to do my own thing. So it was actually during the year in China where I decided I was wrestling with this idea of kind of being a business person or going to save the world and be a humanitarian. And uh, I decided I, I just wanted to do sort of both. And so I wanted to harness the power of business but really build very different transformative business models. Um, I didn't even know what that meant when I sort of had this vision of what my life was going to be. But Started really doing it, um, you know, around that time, and both through nonprofit and for-profit startups, and 
since then have been building a series of social enterprise startups, for-profit, non-profit, everything from you know, business process outsourcing and doing kind of back office to the social sector, to things like food production and retail products and job training models. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so fun to kind of be in the experimental space of trying to really disrupt, um, you know, whether it's different industries or different community models with new creative tactics. So I think I really found my passion in that space. And, you know, I never cruised. Um, and I had really never thought about the industry when um, a good friend of mine who is our holdings company CEO at now as of the last five years, he and I were sort of catching up about his new role. And as I started learning a little bit more about this industry and the way it kind of touched the world, we sort of started riffing on different ideas. And I was, you know, just um, giving him sort of my sort of thoughts on this niche that they hadn't really played in and in the, in the impact space. And he was sort of like, yeah, you should come and do that. And uh, at the time, I was busy building something else. So I thought it was crazy and foolish. And, um, but that was, you know, five years ago now. So um, it's been a, a really... Um, exciting and powerful opportunity to have influence within a really big platform. And so, you know, I talked to a lot of people about this idea of impact and business. And I think it's important to really think about your influence um, almost more so than just the idea of impact, because like how you show up and like your leadership values and your mindset and sort of approach is as you know, influential and impactful um, wherever you might be, right? And different seasons bring different opportunities to learn and grow in different ways. So I think also just being thoughtful about what you want to see in yourself developed in a season and not trying to solve for the whole thing, but really more having an idea and an imagination about where and how you want to grow and maybe what you want to bring into whatever place, you know, you plan to show up in. And to, to piggyback on that, I think that it's, it is really important to, for any entrepreneur or um, just leader of any capacity to, to be sure to align your, your passions with your purpose. You know, we all have different things that we're, we're drawn more closely to. I'm really passionate about animal welfare, for example. Um, that's where my heart is. Um, and, you know, while I always loved animals growing up, I didn't really... Um, discover how much I love them until I started volunteering in animal rescue here in Los Angeles. So I feel like spending the time volunteering is a great way to um, sort of really discover your passions because when you align your passion and your purpose, that's the ultimate case that you need to have to be able to uh, wake up every day and sustain towards your goals um, over a long period of time. If those things aren't aligned, you know, for Kind Traveler, it's, it's taken uh, four years of re you know, research and development before we could even launch. And we've been live for two years, so it's been a six-year journey. Certainly, if my passion was not alive, alive and thriving within the business, uh, it would be extremely difficult to, you know, kind of uh, get up every day and fight the fight of, you know, the challenges that any business owner faces in, in starting a business. So I always say spend that time um, doing that because it's really important for the bigger journey. But um, my career started, um, I have a, a bachelor's in science and biology, and then I got a master's in education. And I started out as an earth science teacher at University of California, San Diego's preschool. And as much as I love, you know, I always had a heart for science and for sustainability. Um, and as much as I loved being a teacher, I just had this sort of longing, this calling to sort of go outside the four, the four walls, so to speak, in the classroom and um, learn the business world. So I had an opportunity. Um, some friends from college started. Um, they, had a, they launched a magazine company, actually. It was a lifestyle magazine. And I had an opportunity to become one of their very first employees of this startup. And um, I joined their advertising team. I, I, I completely switched careers. I mean, I had you know, no idea what I was doing, but I, I learned, uh, I, I eventually became their sales director and then eventually their associate publisher over a five-year period. Um, but working in a startup, 
I was able to learn like so many things about business that um, I would have never have learned anywhere else. But especially like when you have no marketing budget and you have to be really scrappy. And so you learn, you know, the essentials of strategic partnerships. And um, I learned how to run a sales team. I learned how to hire and find and grow, cultivate a sales team. And um, I went on to work with a couple other different publications over a 10-year period. And I looked back and I said, you know, I was at one point responsible for $20 million in advertising sales. And that was great. I had gone on this journey, but there was still something really missing. There was something that I wanted to connect to deeper, um, more deeply. And I had um, really um, got the entrepreneurial bug as well, working with a startup. Also, um, certainly my dad, um, he, he was a business owner and he had always, I think, been planting these seeds as I grew up um, about um, having your own business. So I, I had had that in my head, but it all really came full circle when I um, kind of pulled back and I spent some time really thinking about how I wanted to um, spend the rest of my career. And that's when I started volunteering and um, realized that I loved, you know, wanted to support animals in some way, but I also had this passion for travel. And that's when I actually went back to school at UCLA Extension and started taking mm -hmm. um, classes in um, journalism. I took classes in philanthropy, um, in, in business plan development, and in, in, in sort of all these different classes and really honing my passion. And when it, it all came together, um, I started travel writing. Um, I had a column on CBS Los Angeles. I started freelancing um, for Fast Company, writing about social good. And um, it all sort of came together when um, I went on a trip to Belize with my uh, co-founder, Sean, and um, we witnessed a lot of poverty. And we saw emaciated dogs um, roaming the streets and families living in shacks next to polluted swamps. And um, as a travel writer at the time, it was just, you know, I had a really hard time separating the travel experience from what I had actually seen and witnessed. And I wanted to help, but I didn't know how. And it was just a really confusing thing. And that experience is what prompted us to think about, you know, what if we used our, our entrepreneurial backgrounds and um, created a way to make it easy for travelers to give back to local communities. And we started doing the research and being a journalist, I started interviewing hoteliers and hotels and doing white papers for the boutique lodging industry. And I just uncovered this, um, you know, in my interviews, like they all, all the hotels, they were looking for ways to become more socially responsible. They wanted traveler facing initiatives. They, you know, it was something, it was, there was a need there in the industry. And, um, you know, over four years of, of building this website, we launched with um, 20, three hotel partners in 12 different cities. And, um, and, and then that journey began. So um, it was, you know, a lot of shifts and different things that, that took place to get um, to where we are now. But I'm really glad that I spent that time um, just sort of, you know, understanding what my real passions were, because that's what drives you forward every day. Well, we'll have a chance to continue having our conversation with both Tara and Jessica out at the reception. But join me in thanking both of them for being here and sharing all these wonderful insights. <laughs>